In 2022, 7,500 people were walking down the street when a car came, hit them, and killed them. That's roughly the population of Solvang, California here, a place with 6,000 permanent residents, though at any given time, there's easily another 1,500 tourists. And in the summertime, probably a lot more than that. Solvang's a little slice of Denmark right here in Southern California. So if you wanted to picture Copenhagen with palm trees, this is the place. A group of Danish American put down roots here a century ago, and residents have spent the last 75 years embracing Danish culture, although perhaps not as authentic as a Dane might hope it would be. When you think about Denmark, it's not the kind of place where there's a subway. We're here to check out Highland Adventures, the fastest and fastest and longest in California. Yeah, but uh, I saw the South Park episode and the zip lines are supposed to be boring. Well, South Park lies. Oh. Well, I guess I'm wrong. The town's not Danish. It's pirate themed. Arrgh. Easy to have a little too much fun in a town whose Danish authenticity is about on the same level as wearing a Starfleet uniform to a Renaissance fair. If you wanted to picture Copenhagen with a beef jerky experience, this is the place. But goofing around is not why I'm here. Imagine what kind of a natural disaster it would be if a big meteor crashed down and smashed the town and all of its fake windmills and everything, and everybody was gone. And then the very next year, after we've rebuilt the town and 7,500 more people have moved in, another meteor comes and smashes all the new windmills and everybody's gone. That would be a disaster. We'd say, oh, we need to fix this meteor solving problem. And yet that's exactly what's happening with people walking down the street in America. 7,500 people per year. But what makes it sadder is just a couple of years ago, that number was a lot smaller. Nearly half as much. After decades of watching pedestrian fatalities go down and down and down, everything turned around and we've undone 40 years of progress and now just as many people are dying as they were in 1980. And it really spiked after 2020. And I want to know why. Does it have something to do with where we drive? It'd also be a pretty scary place to walk. What we drive. It takes off like a sports car. <laughs> How we drive. He's texting while driving. What an idiot. And will technology save us from ourselves? Self-driving is definitely a good step forward in protecting uh, pedestrians. I, don't, I didn't know her name, but I, I waved. Actually, that, that morning, I seen her cleaning her yard, and I waved at her. Luther didn't see the accident, but he sure heard it. Somebody's mom, age 83, was in great shape for her age. She would be out a lot of times in the mornings, just sweeping around, like from the debris that falls down from the trees. She's walking across the street to see a neighbor, got part way across the street, and she didn't make it. I was turned the opposite way. I heard the hit, but I think it was car to car. Everybody's running down the street. Then when I got down there, she was she was on the ground. I was like, man. Definitely a tragedy, and it should not have happened. Renata lives next door. I never would have imagined that I would come home and someone is laying in front of my driveway. She tells me she's grateful she wasn't home and didn't have to see the accident. But the aftermath was right in front of her house. The driver, when they had him pulled over, and he seemed like he was very distraught. Like, this was not something that he intended on doing. The story is just so awful. And I got thinking, this increase in pedestrian deaths we're seeing the last few years, the spike, these are thousands of people, thousands of families who are going through a similar story. And if we want to undo this, if we want to reverse it, we need to get into the data and figure out what's going on. The Governor's Highway Safety Administration collects pedestrian crash data from all 50 states and puts them together each year into one big report. I'm hoping clues from their data point to why this is happening. This crash happened about 10 o'clock at night. Maybe the driver turned down the street going a little too fast. Or, you know, maybe not. And perhaps maybe she wandered out into traffic without properly looking as well. Maybe, maybe not. But maybe the time of day is at fault. Out of everybody hit and killed by a car, 75% of them got hit while walking in the dark. And that's a real problem here on 66th Street. 20 houses share just three street lights, and only one of them works. Neighbors on the street tell me they're growing frustrated with the city of Los Angeles. That's why I reached out the other day. It's a, definitely a safety hazard. Then we'll call, you know, then 
they go out again. But recently they said they cut wires on the pole. We don't know who cut them. Potentially vandalism, making the city's backlog of repairs even longer. So I'm standing underneath one of the broken street lights and I'm crossing the street toward you. Can you see me in the dark? Because I can't see me in the dark. Prayers for the family and the young man as well. This is just an eye opener for him and that he gets some help too. One clue in the data, since that spike in 2010, nighttime fatalities have skyrocketed while the daytime number has just gone up modestly. When a state records a pedestrian death, they categorize it into one of three road types, freeways, non-freeway arteries, and run-of-the-mill city streets. So if speed kills, you'd think freeways would be where most of the people are hit. Well, that's not quite the case. The freeway category sees the fewest pedestrian fatalities, which makes sense. There are no pedestrians on a freeway. States ban walking on the freeway because it's just not safe to walk alongside traffic that's going 65, 75, sometimes even 85 miles per hour. But the report's authors point out 1,300 people still died walking around on a freeway. What were they doing there in the first place? Car breaks down or runs out of gas. That proverbial image of the dad with the jerry can having to walk to the next exit to get a few gallons of gas to get back on the road. Or what happened to me a few weeks ago, I got a flat tire just down the road here on I-5. Thanks to cell phones, I was able to call and get help from the second type of unwitting pedestrian, people who come to help out people like me. Probably a good move. Over 80% of the people killed walking around on freeways are in the dark. Thankfully, that's the job of roadside assistance people who show up prepared. Police officers and firefighters, they have to walk around on freeways when they respond to injuries and accidents to keep construction zone workers safe. They put up barriers and post speed limits that are slower to get people to slow down and pay attention so they don't get hit. But they too are a pedestrian out there on that freeway. If we take a look at that pie graph, freeways, of course, with the smallest sliver there, but regular city streets, well, that's the next one. And it makes sense because that's where most people are walking. It's where you have businesses and schools and homes and hopefully sidewalks that connect them all together. City streets are a place where drivers expect to see pedestrians. And when engineers do their job right, crosswalks can be very visible. There's even an entire toolkit engineers can use to help drivers pay better attention to people walking down the street. And when you stop to consider how many people are walking around on city streets, it's actually pretty remarkable that it only comes in second. A far cry for second. It's walking along that third category. Wait till you get outside of town. Where you get into some trouble. A pedestrian may find themselves in real trouble where the sidewalk ends. Wait till you get outside of town. <laughs> a rural two-lane highway with a speed limit of 55 miles per hour. It's not fun to walk along. And technically, if I didn't want to get muddy, this is California, so I'm not going to get muddy, I'd have to step all the way out here, basically in the travel lane. And that's not safe. So I'm back out here in the mud. Regardless the muddiness problem of your state, these kind of roads are dangerous no matter where you live. One thing these rural highways seem to have in common from coast to coast is that there's never a dedicated space for me. The report says more than half of fatalities happen at a place where there's no sidewalk. And in 2021, that grew to over 68%. There's long distances between towns, and so there's typically not a lot of people walking. So I can understand an engineer thinking, well, we don't need to put in a place for people to walk because nobody walks this. But that's dangerous thinking because drivers aren't looking for me because why would I be there? If there's one place where pedestrians really need a sidewalk, it's in places where drivers aren't looking for pedestrians. It's too bad part of the standard design of a rural highway isn't to pave a little three or four foot strip of asphalt just off to the side over there. It would really make it a much more pleasant experience to walk and it would probably cut down on pedestrian fatalities too. So this wasn't part of my research, I just noticed this coming out here, but where the rural highway meets the freeway, the bridge, can also be a pretty scary place to walk. <laughs> this sidewalk is like one foot wide. This category also includes big suburban boulevards. The real issue with a bad suburban arterial street is lack of 
thought as to where pedestrians are going to cross. Some places don't bother to even put in sidewalks, and where they do, there can be too many business driveways. Each driveway apron like this one is a place where a pedestrian can get hit by a car. It creates that conflict between a motorist and a pedestrian. When cities work with private property owners to reduce the number of driveways, really consolidate them. You reduce the number of places cars and people tangle. The place that's safer for a pedestrian to walk. And frankly, better for drivers too. If building decent sidewalks are really low on a city's list of priorities, there's a good chance building a decent crosswalk is not on their list at all. But when a city does make an effort, even a huge street can be reasonably safe. This street here, is eight lanes wide. This was supposed to be the 126 freeway. California never built it, so the city built this street to do its job. And yet this is not a deadly place to walk. Sure, it's not the most pleasant, but I do have street trees and a nice big sidewalk and a big bike lane here. With few places a car can hit you because the city intentionally restricted where businesses could put their driveway. Unfortunately, when it comes to suburban arterials and rural highways, there are probably more bad examples than good. I can understand why this category sees the highest percentage of pedestrian deaths. A bad place to be for the growing number of people who live and sleep on these streets. As the state of Utah looked at their crash data, they found a lot of people were dying right here near a community resource center for people experiencing homelessness. So the state installed this hawk beacon to help people get across the street. You know, one thing I just noticed, UDOT put in these really bright downward pointing LEDs. It lights me up like it's daytime. That's pretty cool. But it's not just the street we need to worry about. The cars hitting us are growing more deadly. Not long ago when Americans wanted to buy a car, they bought a car. But that's changed in the last decade. Sales of passenger cars have collapsed as people started buying sport utility vehicles and pickup trucks like this F-250 here. Every hour, Ford sells over 100 F-Series pickup trucks. That's one every 40 minutes. So I decided to rent one to see why we Americans love our light pickups and SUVs so much. I hate pickup trucks. They use too much gas. That's a freeway number, not a gas price. Eh, they're a pain in a parking lot. I don't want to squish between those two. That'll work. I'm getting lazier every minute. Mission accomplished. Yet the longer I drive this, the more I second guess my opinions. Whoa. <laughs> It takes off like a sports car. <laughs> when you don't have smooth German roads, this is your BMW. I don't have time for this. I'm in a Ford. Oh no, there's no way. New car sales had been staying neck and neck until about 10 years ago when they dropped like a rock. Today, for every regular car a dealership sells, three or four other buyers are driving home in a new SUV or light truck. Man, that's a problem. If my path crosses with a regular passenger car, it's gonna hit me in the lower leg down here. I'm probably gonna fall onto the hood. Yeah, I'm gonna end up in the hospital, but I have a chance of surviving. But end up with tangling with an SUV or a big F-Series pickup like Americans like to buy now, and all my internal organs are gonna get smushed. And then I'm gonna have a second round of fun as I fall down this way, go underneath the truck, and have some fun time with the tires. Survivability, not quite so good. In the future, federal rules for crash tests may include pedestrian safety, like car makers already have to deal with in the European Union. But the safest crash is one that doesn't happen in the first place. Oh, I didn't even see that guy. Which is hard to do when we're not even looking up at the windshield at the time. Can self-driving car tech save us? Road videos with no YouTube ads. Contribute any amount, then sign in with your Patreon account at roadguyrob.com. Distracted driving? Hello? Used to be a lot more obvious. What? That was today. All right. Using a car phone, sure. Well, what's uh, next Thursday looking like? With a calendar? Looking like for you. Certainly not a camera. Yeah, that's this lady. She's texting while driving. What an idiot. We just intuitively knew. It's gonna cost me how much? Dangerous was dangerous. You gotta be kidding me. But then, we got the most distracting candy bar. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Ever made. This is one device, iPhone. Actually, we all went out and bought one right around 2010, which coincidentally is when the pedestrian deaths 
turned around and started going back up. The report doesn't link those two things together specifically, but I think it's worth a note. And then it gets twice as bad because it's not just us dangerous, distracted drivers having one of these. That guy has one too. The smartphone made preoccupied pedestrians more of a problem. So how much of our phones contributed to the increase in crashes? Well, we just don't know. Drivers don't exactly volunteer to a police officer that they were fiddling around on their phone. But what we do know is a driver is two to six times more likely to crash because phones distract us mentally and they take our eyes off the road. So when I get distracted, it will alert me but there's a lot of cases where we've proven it doesn't do an effective job. John Bernal used to work for an unnamed Fremont, California-based electric car company. My job was to data label. After six months of doing that internally, I thought it'd be really cool to, you know, buy my own Tesla, download the software. Then post videos, testing out the new automation technology, which promises to make the road safer for pedestrians by having a camera focused outward to look for pedestrians and other cars, but also a camera facing inward to make sure drivers aren't getting distracted. We go to downtown Oakland, try to T-bone maybe a dozen cars. Car right there. John tested his car to see how well it navigated the surrounding streets and people. And that's when we go to San Francisco and my car decides to size swipe a bush. Oh, uh, I'm gonna take over because the car is scratched. The company's president didn't really like his videos. Next thing I know, I'm brought into a Teams meeting with a, with a supervisor. They asked me to stop posting videos that were negative. It's a long story, but he now has a better job with a different tech company. That doesn't stop him from still testing out his car. And now, now whoa. Okay. Now so I tried it, to try to take that 45. So it thought we could go straight through there. But despite the glaring bad. flaws he's finding, he tells me the tech to detect other cars and pedestrians is generally pretty good. Distractingly good. Now we're going. And I did get lulled into a uh, into a false sense of uh, what the car could do. Came to a full stop here. I got a little bored. I was like, oh, it's just a normal right hand turn. It's got this. I decided to look a little left at some other traffic and let it take the turn on its own. Oh, 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 oh. I crashed the car. Had that been a person instead of a pole, that wouldn't have been good. Wow, I can't believe the car didn't stop. Using a closed road near Santa Barbara, his car's autonomous system hit fake children, fake dogs, fake everything. Evidently, the camera looking out to detect pedestrians isn't quite ready. But maybe the camera pointed in to make sure we're paying attention while we drive? Well, maybe it's good to go. Uh oh. We start with a teddy bear. The car's computer is supposed to deactivate the automated features if your human eyes are not paying attention. And the car also ran over the fake pedestrian. People probably thought we, we did something wrong, so we're like, hey, you can do this with a unicorn. We threw a little dog in the back out the window just for some comedic effect. Once again, the Tesla plows through a child mannequin while full self-driving beta is engaged. But suppose the computer is not that smart. Bears and unicorns have faces. They look attentive. We put a champagne balloon. The car still worked. And by that, I mean, it didn't work. Well, I suppose a champagne balloon has a face. Kind of. But you know what doesn't have one? Nothing. Ultimately, we could have let it go for 20, 30 minutes if we wanted to, and it probably would have never given us a strike. Blowing through do not enter signs and caution tape and hitting little Timmy stops, and then it just keeps driving. Personally, I do believe that self-driving technology are definitely a good step forward in terms of protecting uh, pedestrians who are on the road. But I do think that there are a few companies that did put profit before safety. John's research is such a hoot to watch. You want to head over to his YouTube channel, AI Addict, and watch the full videos. See what a self-driving car is and isn't capable of. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here when it comes to the spike, and we talked about the time of day, the type of street, the size of car, and it's hard to know what's contributing to the spike and what's just a thing that's always been a problem. I mean, nighttime didn't exactly just appear in the last couple of years, but yet the data shows nighttime's contributing to the spike. It gets complicated. So I reached out to one state that's seen a big spike, the state of Virginia. The DMV keeps track of those records, and a staffer there, a researcher, tells me that, yeah, in 2022, they saw a 37% spike in fatalities, which is way above the 10-year average. But the good news is, in 2023, that number has started to come back down. So maybe, she didn't say this, but part of me wonders if it's some sort of weird, like, COVID blip, and maybe it'll get better. So I guess to conclude, what's causing the spike? 
Well, we just don't know. But what we do know is we can be working on the persistent fatalities that are always there, that 4,000 that were still dying before the spike. Work on making our streets better. And our cars safer, and our drivers more attentive. And if we carve out the base a little bit, that'll pull the top line number down, make the roads safer for everybody. And maybe we'll get lucky, and some of that spike will come down on its own too and pull it down even further. I'll see you next time. If you'd like to watch my full interview with John talking about advanced driver assistance systems, click on that bottom video or look for a link down in the show notes. This video is made possible without any in-video sponsorship thanks to generous contributors like you that give a couple of bucks each month at patreon.com slash roadguyrob.